Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Frank DiBernardo, and I am the executive director of New Ways Ministry. And I'm <laughs> okay. And I'm, del I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon to New Ways Ministries Bridge Building Award Ceremony otherwise known as the Catholic LGBT Academy Awards. <laughs> Who is going to get best supportive the church leader? The tension is thick. Stay tuned to find out. I hope you all enjoyed your time on the red carpet as you entered the ballroom today. <laughs> New Ways Ministries Bridge Building Award may not look like an Oscar statuette, but it certainly carries all the prestige and not to mention glamour that the Little Hollywood ceremony does. The Bridge Building Award honors individuals who by their scholarship, leadership, or witness have promoted discussion, understanding, and reconciliation between the LGBT community and the Catholic Church. Throughout the, the past few years, when the debates about LGBT topics have gotten incredibly stormy, there has been no one who has exemplified the values of this award more than today's recipient, Father James Martin. New Ways Ministry was so honored when Father Martin agreed to accept the award. Not only is he the leading Catholic spirituality author and lecturer on the circuit today, not only does he have the revered and coveted title of having been Stephen Colbert's chaplain, <laughs> not only is he one of the most prominent and influential Catholic voices on social media, but Father James Martin has also achieved a status that only one other Jesuit has, has achieved recently, Pope Francis. <laughs> You've all heard of the Pope Francis effect how the power of Pope Francis's charm and charisma is a strong influence on the real world. Well, at New Ways Ministry, we often speak of the James Martin effect. When he posts something about New Ways Ministry's social media on his social media outlets, the number of views our material receives is usually about 20 times higher than usual. Being mentioned by Father Martin is better than being mentioned by the New York Times or CNN. <laughs> While we are extremely proud of all the past recipients of the Bridge Building Award who are, and they are listed in your program, Father Martin is really the first 21st century recipient of the award. And by 21st century, I don't mean the date, but I mean the media environment of the contemporary world in which we live. Father Martin's reach expands through publishing, journalism, television, radio, comedy, news shows, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. And while I haven't checked, I wouldn't be surprised if he's on Instagram and Snapchat. But just don't ask me what those last two things are. I'm, I'm not that hip. <laughs> and today's award ceremony is the first 21st century bridge building award ceremony in another way, in that it is being live streamed on the internet. We are honored and delighted that all of you in this room could make it to Baltimore and celebrate with us today. But we are also honored and delighted that many of our friends who couldn't be present are able to participate 
in this event through the magic of live streaming. So welcome to all of you out there. I want to give a special shout out to the campus ministries of several Jesuit schools who are watching from their universities. Santa Clara University, California, Regis University in Denver, and Loyola University, Chicago. And I'm sure there are others too. Plus, I want to give a warm welcome to many, to New Ways Ministries, many friends who are watching on the internet too. So everyone, please settle in, whether you're here in the room or at home in your living room, as we begin today's ceremony with an invocation prayer from the 1995 recipient of the Bridge Building Award, a man who has been a tireless advocate for justice, peace, and LGBT acceptance, Bishop Thomas Gumbleton. Now we pause for a moment of quiet as we turn to God in prayer. Every day we praise and bless you, O oh God, you who love the human race and always go with us on our journey of life. Blessed indeed is your son Jesus present in our midst as we gather in your name and when as once for his disciples, so now for us, he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. But today we praise you even more. As we come together to thank you for the working of your spirit in the life of our brother and friend, James Martin. Through his life and our community of disciples, through his writing, through his sharing with his hundreds of thousands of Facebook friends, Father Martin speaks your message of respect and love for every person. He is truly a bridge builder who advances in a bold and clear way the making of a human family where slowly but surely we come to realize a worldwide community in which there is neither rich nor poor, slave nor free, male or female, Jew or Greek, for all are one in you, our God. We are pleased to honor Father Martin today and we ask you to continue to bless him, strengthen him, make his work flourish as he continues to dismantle barriers that divide us and shows us the way to build the reign of God in our world. We thank you, God, for Jim Martin and his life of loving service for us and our whole human family. Through him, may each one of us be inspired in building 
the bridges that will bring all of us together in a world of peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Gumbleton, for leading us in prayer. I now would like to introduce the person who's going to give the testimonial to Father Martin in anticipation of the award presentation. She is someone who has won many awards in her 45-year ministry and whose very life has been a bridge between LGBT people and the Catholic Church. New Ways Ministries co-founder, Sister Janine Gramick. Well, my job is to introduce Father James Martin, who really doesn't need an introduction. But I'm not going to introduce him by recounting the story of all the degrees that he has accumulated and the ministries that he has been engaged in or the many books that he has authored or all the honors and acclaims that he has received. You can read all about that in your program. I would like to describe why we at New Ways Ministry feel that Father Martin is important to the LGBT community and to the church and why we at New Ways are honoring him today. In the last decade or so, LGBT issues have become very prominent in the news, in political circles, and in church conversations. We believe that the Catholic leader who has been the most influential in these conversations, particularly in our church, in providing support to LGBT people and their families and friends is Father James Martin. He's done this as Frank was enumerating, through the wide audience that he has gathered, through his blog on the America website, through pages in uh, the America magazine itself, through his Twitter account, and in that Twitter account, I um, understand that he reaches about 77,000 followers, and through his Facebook page, he reaches about a half a million of his closest friends. <laughs> so we are honoring him because of the wide influence that he exerts through this medium, all of these media, the wide influence that he exerts on the grassroots church. He is reaching Catholics in the pew and he's reminding them of what it means to be a Christian by welcoming LGBT people in the church and by treating them with dignity and respect. So that wide influence is really an important mark of why we feel he deserves this award. Now, if you're wondering, well, you know, what's Twitter, you know, what, uh, what, it mean, what does it mean to be a follower? You know, what's all this social media? Because many of us, myself included, uh, included uh, you know, we're not high tech. But you just ask any young person, because that's the main way that young people communicate today through all of this kind of media. So Father Martin is reaching a new audience, a young audience. He's spreading the message that LGBT people are beloved children of God, 
to these young people. He's what we might call an online pastor or a pastor on the web. And it's that influence on the young in our church, as we see many of whom are departing, it's that influence on the young, which is another reason that we feel Father Martin deserves this wonderful bridge building award. He's building bridges with between the church, the wider church community, and the young people. And also, we are honoring Father Martin because he is very prophetic, always respectful, but yet prophetic, and challenges church leaders to speak out more pastorally and more sensitively. Just for example, when the nightclub tragedy occurred in Orlando, shocked the nation, and you know, we had a statement from the US Conference of Catholic Bishops did not mention LGBT. It was just a tragedy that occurred in Orlando. But Father Martin spoke pastorally even while most of these bishops remained silent about the fact that this happened to LGBT people. And when the question, again, of um, another example of, of bathrooms, you know, that was quite in the news. When the question of the use of bathrooms for transgender people hit the news this year, Father Martin said very accommodating words that our bishops refused to say. He said, well, the people, we treat all people with dignity and respect, so I think it's a fairly simple thing to be able to offer people a bathroom. So there are many other reasons that I could share with you about why Father Martin is receiving this award. But um, I'll leave it at that. I would like to now ask the board members that are here, the board members of New Ways Ministry, Mary Byers, Dr. Jerry Fath, if you would come up to the stage, Brother Cornelius Hubbock, Sister Anna Koop, and Ryan Sattler. I ask them to come up to the stage and present this bridge building award and read the proclamation as the award is presented. And Brian will read the proclamation. Father James Martin, your strong but compassionate voice has been prophetic in calling both church leaders and the people in the pews to a more Christian understanding of LGBT people. Your writings have educated, inspired, comforted, and challenged all Catholics, whether LGBT or allies, and even those who have expressed opposition, to look into their hearts and to their consciences to find the place where they could love their neighbors better. You have used modern media to build bridges between people while varying points of view, helping them in dialogue with one another, showing them that discussion and discernment are the real Catholic values when presented in new and emerging realities. And you have done all these things of communication with grace and with humor, helping people at whatever point they are to deeper understandings and ultimately to a deeper relationship with their God. 
So, in the name of all of us gathered here today, New Ways Ministry is so proud to present the Bridge Building Award to Reverend James Martin S.J. for initiating a wide Catholic conversation on LGBT issues and for teaching the new generation, a new generation about respect, compassion, and sensitivity. This day, October 30th, 2016, in Baltimore, Maryland, congratulations, Father James Martin. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor to be considered someone who builds bridges uh, in the church that we love so much and to be recognized uh, by New Ways Ministry. Before we go any further, uh, and I have some rather lengthy remarks, uh, I want to recognize five of my heroes who are here. Uh, they have been recognized already, but I would like to recognize them. First and foremost, Sister Janine Gramick. A pioneer in LGBT Catholic relations who, as Frank said, uh, teaches not only with her words, but her life. Second, even though he is escaping, Frank DiBernardo. For his, for his tireless leadership of New Ways Ministry. Third, uh, one of the great bishops in our country, Bishop Thomas Gumbleton. And two new heroes of mine uh, that will speak to you about the, the next generation. Uh, my friend, um, Marco Zuberti is a junior at Regis High School in New York who just came out during a retreat and was wholeheartedly accepted by his father, Ivan Uberti, and I'd like them to stand. My brothers and sisters, the relationship between the LGBT community and the Catholic Church in the United States has been at times contentious and combative, and at times warm and welcoming. Much of the tension characterizing the complicated relationship results, I believe, from a lack of communication, and sadly, a good deal of mistrust between the LGBT community and the hierarchy. What is needed then is a bridge between the LGBT community and the church. And you see my sophisticated AV device. <laughs> so I would like to invite you this afternoon to walk with me on that important bridge. To that end, I would like to reflect on both the church's outreach to the LGBT community as well as the LGBT community's outreach to the church. Because good bridges take people in both directions. As you know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that Catholics are called to treat the homosexual person with, quote, respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Now, what, what, what might that mean? Let's meditate on that as well as on a second question. 
What might it mean for the LGBT community to treat the church with respect, compassion, and sensitivity? Now, of course, LGBT Catholics are part of the church, so in a sense, it's a false dichotomy. And the church is the entire people of God. So in a sense, it's also strange to discuss how the people of God can relate to part of the people of God. So in good Jesuit fashion, let me refine our terms. <laughs> when I refer to the church in this discussion, I mean the institutional church, the Vatican, the hierarchy, church officials, the clergy. So let's take a walk on the first lane of that bridge, the lane leading from the institutional church to the LGBT community, and reflect on respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Respect. What might it mean for the church to respect the LGBT community? First of all, respect means, at the very least, recognizing that the LGBT community exists as any community would want its existence recognized. It also means acknowledging that the LGBT community brings unique gifts to the church, as any community does. Recognizing that LGBT Catholics exist has important pastoral implications. It means carrying out ministries that some dioceses and parishes already do very well. For example, celebrating masses with LGBT groups, sponsoring diocesan and parish outreach programs, and in general, making LGBT Catholics feel part of the church and feel loved. Some Catholics object to this approach, saying that LGBT outreach betokens a tacit approval with everything that anyone in the LGBT community says or does. But that is an unfair objection because it is raised with no other group. If dioceses sponsor, for example, an outreach group for Catholic business leaders, it doesn't mean that the diocese agrees with every value of corporate America, nor does it mean that the, the church has canonized or sanctified everything that every businessman or every businesswoman has said or done. No one ever suggests that. Why not? Because people understand that the diocese is trying to help a particular community feel more connected to their church, the church they belong to by virtue of their baptism. Second, respect means calling a group what it asks to be called. That's a simple sign of respect. On a personal level, if someone says, I prefer to be called Jim instead of James, you would naturally listen, wouldn't you? It's common courtesy. It's the same on a group level. We don't say Negroes any longer. Why not? Because that group feels more comfortable with other names, African Americans or blacks. Recently, just a few months ago, I was told that disabled persons is not as acceptable as persons with disabilities. So that's what I'll use now. Why? Because it's respectful to call people by the name that they choose. Everyone has the right to tell you their name. This is not some minor concern. In the Jewish and Christian traditions, names are important. In the Old Testament, God gives Adam and Eve the authority to name the creatures. God renames Abram as Abraham. Names in the Old Testament stand for a person's identity. Knowing a person's name means that you know him or her. That's one reason why when Moses asks to know God's name, God says, I am who am. In other words, as my Old Testament professor used to say, none of your business. <laughs> Later in the New Testament, Jesus renames Simon as Peter. The persecutor Paul renames him, Saul renames himself Paul. Names are important in our church today as well, right? The first question a priest or deacon asks a parent, parents at baptism is, what name do you give this child? 
Names are important. Thus, church leaders are invited to be attentive to how they name the LGBT community and lay to rest phrases like afflicted with same-sex attraction, which no LGBT person I know uses, or even homosexual persons, which can seem overly clinical to many people. I'm not prescribing what names to use, though gay and lesbian, LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTQI are common. What I'm saying is that people have a right to name themselves. Using those names is part of simple respect. And if Pope Francis can use the word gay, so can the rest of the church. <laughs> Finally, Finally, respecting LGBT people means accept accepting them as beloved children of God and letting them know that they are beloved children of God. The church has a special call to proclaim God's love for a people who are often made to feel like damaged goods, an unworthy ministry, even subhuman, whether by their families, neighbors, or religious leaders. The church is invited to both proclaim and demonstrate that LGBT people are beloved children of God. Moreover, LGBT people are beloved children of God with gifts, special gifts, both as individuals and as a community. These gifts build up the church in unique ways, as St. Paul told us when he compared the people of God to a human body. Every part of the body is important. The hand, the eye, the foot. Just consider the gifts for a moment in your own life that LGBT Catholics have brought who work in parishes, schools, chanceries, retreat centers, hospitals, and social service agencies. Here's an example from my own life. Some of the most gifted music ministers I've known in my almost 30 years of being a Jesuit have been gay men who have brought tremendous joy to their parishes, and they themselves are among the most joyful Catholics who I know. As an aside, I am very disheartened by the trend in a few places of firing LGBT men and women. Of course, Of course, church organizations have the authority to require their employees to follow church teachings. That makes sense. But the problem is that this is applied in a highly selective way. Almost all the church firings in recent years have focused on LGBT matters, and usually on same-sex marriage. Specifically, these firings have most often related to those employees who have entered into same-sex marriages, where one or another has a public role in the church, which is against church teaching. But if adherence to church teaching is going to be a litmus test for employment in Catholic institutions, then dioceses and parishes need to be consistent. Thus, do we fire a straight man or woman who gets divorced and remarried without an annulment? That is against church teaching. In fact, divorce itself is something that Jesus forbade. Do we fire women who bear children out of wedlock? How about a person who's living with someone without being married? Those are against church teachings too. And what about church employees who aren't Catholic? If we are firing employees who don't agree with or adhere to church teaching, do we fire every Protestant who works in a Catholic institution because they don't believe in papal authority? That's an important church teaching. Do we fire Unitarians who don't believe in the Trinity? That's a church teaching. Do we fire all these people for all of these things? No, we do not. Why not? Because we are selective about which church teachings matter. Moreover, Requiring church employees to adhere to church teachings means, at a more fundamental level, adhering to the gospel. To be consistent, 
We should fire people for not helping the poor, for not being forgiving, and for not loving. You laugh at that. It sounds odd, doesn't it? But why should it? Jesus' teachings are the most essential of the church teachings. The selectivity of focus on LGBT matters when it comes to firings is, to use the words of the catechism, quote, a sign of unjust discrimination, end quote, something we are to avoid. Indeed, just this week, America Magazine, where I am proud to work, published an editorial which said, quote, the high public profile of these firings, combined with the apparent lack of due process and the absence of any comparable policing of marital status for heterosexual employees, constitute signs of unjust discrimination, and, in, and the church in the United States should do more to avoid them, end quote. Let's return... And that's not just me, that's the editors of America Magazine. Let's return to the gifts of the LGBT community. The church as a whole is invited to meditate on how LGBT Catholics build up the church with their presence in the same way that elderly people, teenagers, women, people with disabilities, various ethnic groups, or any group builds up a parish. And while it is wrong to generalize, we can still pose and meditate on that question, what might those gifts be? What might the gifts that LGBT Catholics bring to the church be? Well, many, if not most, LGBT people, LGBT people have endured from an early age misunderstanding, prejudice, hatred, persecution, and sometimes even violence. And so they often feel a natural compassion to the marginalized. Compassion is a gift. They have often been made to feel unwelcome in their parishes, in their church, but they persevere because of their vigorous faith. Perseverance is a gift. They are often forgiving of clergy and other church employees who treat them like damaged goods. Forgiveness is a gift. Compassion, perseverance, forgiveness are all gifts that the LGBT person brings to the church. Let me add another gift, that of celibate priests and brothers who are gay and chaste members of men's and women's religious orders who are gay and lesbian. Now there are several reasons, many misunderstood, why almost no gay and lesbian clergy and religious are public about their sexuality. Among them are the following. They are simply private people. That's one reason. Their bishops or religious superiors ask them or order them not to speak about it under obedience. They themselves are uncomfortable with their sexuality. Or they feel re fear reprisals from their parishioners or people with whom they minister. But there are many holy and hardworking clergy and members of religious orders who are gay and lesbian and who live out their promises of celibacy and vows of chastity and help to build up the church. They freely give their whole selves to the church. They themselves are the gift. Seeing and naming all of these gifts is part of respect, part of respecting our LGBT brothers and sisters. Compassion. Let's look at compassion. What would it mean for the church to show compassion to LGBT men and women? The word compassion, as you know, means to experience with or to suffer with. So what would it mean for the institutional church, that is the hierarchy, not only to respect them, but to be with them, to experience life with them, and even to suffer with them? The first and most essential requirement is listening. It is impossible to experience a person's life or to be compassionate if you don't listen to the person or if you don't ask questions. Questions that Catholic leaders might ask their LGBT brothers and sisters could be, what is your life like? What was it like growing up as a gay boy or a lesbian girl or a transgender person? How have you suffered? And what are your joys? 
And what is your experience of God? What is your experience of church? What do you hope for, long for, pray for? For the church to exercise compassion, the church needs to listen. Church leaders also need to stand for their LGBT brothers and sisters when they are persecuted. In many parts of the world, LGBT persons are liable, again in the words of the Catechism, to appalling incidents of unjust discrimination, to prejudice, to violence, even to murder. In some countries, you can be jailed for being gay or having same-sex relations and murdered for being a gay leader. In those countries, the institutional church, the Catholic church, has an absolute moral duty to stand up for their brothers and sisters publicly. Helping someone, standing up for someone when they are being beaten is part of compassion. It is part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if you doubt that, read the parable of the Good Samaritan. Closer to home, what would it mean for the church in the United States to say when needed, it is wrong to treat the LGBT community like this? Catholic leaders regularly publish statements defending, as they should, refugees, migrants, the poor, the homeless, the unborn. This is one way to stand with people by putting yourself out there, even taking heat for them. But where are the statements in support of their LGBT brothers and sisters? Now, you know, when I say this, some people say, well, you can't compare what refugees face with what the LGBT person faces. And as someone who has worked with refugees in East Africa for two years, I know that that is true. But it is important not to ignore the disproportionately high rates of suicide among LGBT youths. The fact that LGBT victims are proportionally, are victims of proportionally more hate crimes than any other minority group in the country. In the wake of the Orlando massacres, when LGBT communities across the country were grieving, I was, as Sister Jeanine pointed out, discouraged that more bishops didn't offer their support. Some did, of course. But imagine if the attacks were on, God forbid, a Methodist parish. Bishops would have most likely said, probably all bishops, we stand with our Methodist brothers and sisters. Why not in Orlando? It seemed to me a kind of failure of compassion, a failure to experience with, to suffer with. Orlando invites us all to reflect on that. But we need not look far for a model on how to do this. God did this for all of us in Jesus. The opening lines of the Gospel of John tell us that the word, quote, became flesh and dwelt among us. The original Greek is more vivid. The word became flesh, and the Greek is eskenosen and haman. I love it. Pitched its tent among us. God pitched his tent among us. Isn't that beautiful? God entered our world to live among us. This is what Jesus did. He lived alongside us. He took our side. He even died like us. This is what the church is called to do with all marginalized groups, as Pope Francis has reminded us, including LGBT Catholics, to experience their lives and to suffer with them and to rejoice with them too, to be joyful with them, because Jesus came to experience all of our lives, not just the sorrowful parts. LGBT people, though they may suffer persecution, share in the joys of the human condition. So can we rejoice with our LGBT brothers and sisters? Next, sensitivity. How can the church be sensitive if we think of respect, compassion, and sensitivity to LGBT people. That's a beautiful word used in the catechism, sensitivity. One dictionary defines it as, quote, an awareness or understanding of the feelings of other people. That's related to Pope Francis's call for the church to be a church of encounter and accompaniment. Two words he uses frequently, encounter and accompaniment. 
Well, to begin with, it's impossible to, under, to, to, to understand another person's feelings at a distance. You can't understand the feelings of a community if you don't know the community. You can't be sensitive to the LGBT community if you only issue documents about them, preach about them, or tweet about them without knowing them. One reason that the institutional church has struggled so much with sensitivity is, in my opinion, that many church leaders still don't know many gay and lesbian people. Now, the temptation, of course, is to smile and say church leaders do know people who are gay, maybe priests and bishops and others who are not public about their homosexuality, but my point is a larger one. Many church leaders do not know LGBT people who are public about their sexuality. This lack of familiarity and friendship means it's more difficult to be sensitive. How can you be sensitive to a person's situation if you don't know them? So one invitation is for the hierarchy to come to know them as friends, as their friends. Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn, the Archbishop of Vienna, reminded us of this at the Synod on the Family recently, when he spoke of a gay couple he knew who had transformed his understanding of LGBT people. The Cardinal said, quote, one shares one's life, one shares the joys and sufferings, one helps one another. We must recognize that this person has made an important step for his own good and for the good of others, even though this is not the situation that the church considers regular, end quote. He also, Cardinal Schoenborn, overruled a priest in his archdiocese who had prohibited a man in a same-sex union to serve in a parish council. That is, Cardinal Schoenborn stood with him. Much of this came from his own experience, his knowledge of, his friendship with LGBT people. Cardinal Schoenborn said simply, quote, we must accompany, end quote. In this, as in all things, Jesus is our model. When Jesus encountered people on the margins, he saw not a category, but a person. To be clear, I'm not saying that the LGBT community should be or should feel marginalized. Rather, I'm saying that within the church, many of them do find themselves marginalized. But for Jesus, there was no other. Jesus saw beyond categories. He met people where they were, and he accompanied them. In the Gospel of Luke, when he met a Roman centurion, remember this story, who asks for healing for his servant? Jesus doesn't say, you pagan. He saw a man in need. Later in Luke's Gospel, today's reading, the story of Zacchaeus, one of my favorite stories, when he meets Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector in all of Jericho, who, by the way, at the time would have been considered, therefore, the chief sinner in all Jericho. He doesn't say sinner. Rather, he sees a man seeking to encounter him. Jesus was willing to stand with, to be with, and to befriend these people who were seen as other, because there's no other for Jesus. Now, one common exception here, which I hear all the time, is to say this, no, no, Father, Jesus always told them, first of all, not to sin. So we cannot meet gay people because they are sinning, goes the argument. And when we do meet them, the first thing we must say is stop sinning. But more often than not, that is not Jesus's way. In the story of Zacchaeus, if you think about it, Jesus first spies the tax collector perched high in that sycamore tree, remember? Because we're told Zacchaeus is short of stature. Trying to catch sight of Jesus. He could not see him because of the crowd. Very interesting way of thinking of things. He could not see Jesus because of the crowd. Jesus sees him in the tree, calls him down and says he will dine at Zacchaeus' house. A sign of welcome in first century Palestine, before Zacchaeus had said or done anything. Only after Jesus offers him welcome is Zacchaeus moved to conversion, promising to pay back anyone he has defrauded. 
Likewise, in the story of the Roman centurion, Jesus doesn't scold the man for being pagan. Instead, he praises the man's faith, right? And heals his servant. For Jesus, more often than not, it is community first, conversion second. The Pope echoed this in a recent press conference. Quote, people must be accompanied as Jesus accompanied, he said. When a person who has this situation comes before Jesus, Jesus will surely not say, go away because you're a homosexual, end quote. Sensitivity then is based on encounter, accompaniment, and friendship. And where does that lead? To the second meaning of the word, which is in common parlance, a sensitivity and an awareness to something that might offend. We are sensitive to their situations, and so we are sensitive to anything that might needlessly offend. One way to be sensitive is to consider the language we use. Some bishops have already called for us to set aside the phrase objectively disordered when it comes to describing the homosexual inclination. Now the word relates to the orientation, not the person, but it is still needlessly hurtful. Saying that one of the deepest parts of a person the part that gives and receives love is disordered in itself, is needlessly cruel. Setting aside such language was discussed at the recent Synod on the Family, according to several news outlets. More recently, an Australian bishop, Vincent Long Van Nguyen, said, quote, We cannot talk about the integrity of creation, the universal and inclusive love of God, while at the same time colluding with the forces of oppression in the ill treatment of racial minorities, women, and homosexual persons. It won't wash with young people, especially when we purport to treat gay people with love and compassion and yet define their sexuality as intrinsically disordered." End quote. Part of sensitivity is understanding that. Now, let's take a walk on the second lane of the bridge the one leading from the LGBT community to the institutional church. It's not a bridge that's talked about a lot. What would it mean, and it may be more challenging questions, for the LGBT community to treat the institutional church with respect, compassion, and sensitivity? Now, in the church, it is the hierarchy that possesses institutional power. They have the power to allow someone to receive the sacraments to permit or prevent priests from celebrating the sacraments, to open or close diocesan or parish ministries, to allow people to retain their jobs in Catholic institutions, and so on. But the LGBT community has some power, too. Increasingly, for instance, the Western media, I think, is much more sympathetic to the LGBT community than to the hierarchy in general. That's a kind of power. Still, in the institutional church, the hierarchy is, in general, in the position of power. LGBT Catholics are called to treat those in power with respect, sensitivity, and compassion. Why? Because, as I mentioned, it's a two-way bridge. More importantly, because LGBT Catholics are Christians, and those virtues express Christian love. Those virtues also build up the entire community. So respect. What would it mean for the LGBT community to show respect to the church? Here again, I'm speaking specifically about the Pope and the bishops, that is the hierarchy, and more broadly, the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. Now Catholics, as you know, believe that bishops, priests, and deacons receive at their ordination the grace for a special kind of ministry of leadership in the church. They're not the only kind of leaders, but they receive a special grace. We also believe that bishops in particular have an authority that comes down to them from the apostles. That's what we mean in part when we profess our belief each Sunday at Mass, that I'm sure we all did today, that the church is apostolic. Also, we believe the Holy Spirit in guides and inspires the church. Certainly that happens through the people of God, who as the Second Vatican Council reminded us, are imbued with the Spirit but it also happens through the Pope, bishops, and clergy by virtue of their ordination and their offices. 
So the institutional church, popes and councils, archbishops and bishops, speak with authority in their roles as teachers. Now, they all don't speak with the same level of authority, more about that later, but Catholics must prayerfully consider what they are teaching. To do that, we're called to listen as well. We are called to listen. Their teaching deserves our respect. So first of all, listen on all matters, not just LGBT issues. The Episcopacy speaks with authority and draws from a great well of tradition. When bishops speak on matters like, but not confined to, love, forgiveness, mercy, caring for the poor and marginalized, the unborn, homeless, prisoners, refugees, and so on, they are drawing not only on the Gospels, but from the spiritual treasury of the Church's tradition. Oftentimes, especially on social justice issues, you may find that they will challenge you with a wisdom you will not hear anywhere else in the world. And when they speak about LGBT matters in a way that you don't agree with, angers you, or offends you, listen anyway. Ask yourself, what are they saying? Why are they saying it? What lies behind their words? Listen, consider, think, discuss, pray, and of course, use your conscience. Beyond what you might call ecclesial respect, the hierarchy deserves simple human respect. Often I am, even as an advocate for LGBT Catholics, disheartened by the things that I hear some LGBT Catholics and their allies saying about certain bishops. I hear these things often privately, but sometimes publicly. Recently, one LGBT group, in response to a statement from bishops, I think on same-sex marriage, said that the bishops should stop being locked in their ivory towers. And I thought, Really? You're saying that to bishops in poor dioceses that live in ivory towers, to bishops who personally minister to the poor, who oversee parishes in inner city neighborhoods, sponsor schools that educate the inner city poor, and manage Catholic charities offices? You may disagree with the bishops, but that kind of language is not only disrespectful, it's inaccurate in many cases. More seriously, LGBT Catholics and their allies sometimes mock bishops mercilessly for, you name it, their promises of celibacy, their residences, and especially the clothes they wear. Yeah, and you're laughing. Wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> the barely disguised implication of posting online photos of bishops wearing elaborate liturgical vestments is that they are effeminate, they're hypocrites, or they are repressed gay men. And here's my question. Does the LGBT community really want to proceed in that way? Do gay men want to mock bishops as effeminate when many gay men were probably teased about those precise things when they were boys? Is that not simply perpetuating hatred? How can someone castigate a bishop for not respecting the LGBT community while not affording them respect? Do we want to critique people for their unchristian attitudes by ourselves being unchristian? This may be hard for people to hear, I know, who feel beaten down by the church, maybe people in this room, but being respectful of people with whom you disagree is not only the Christian way, even from a human point of view, it's good strategy. If you, I often tell LGBT Catholics this, if you really want to influence the church's perspective on LGBT matters, really want to do that, it helps to earn the trust of the hierarchy. And one way to do that is respecting them. So both the Christian approach and simple human wisdom says, respect them. Second, compassion. This is a strange thing. What might it mean to show compassion to the hierarchy, even if you have been beaten down or have felt beaten down by them? First, let us recall the definition of compassion, to experience with, to suffer with. Part of that, as I mentioned, is knowing what a person's life is like. So part of compassion towards the institutional church is a felt understanding of the life of those in power. In my own life as a Jesuit priest, 
So I've been a Jesuit for almost 30 years. I've met cardinals, archbishops, bishops, patriarchs, everything you can name. Quite a few of those men I consider my friends, truly. All of the ones I have met are kind, hardworking, prayerful men, many of whom have been very kind to me personally and who are loyal sons of the church trying to carry out the ministries for which they were ordained. And these days, in addition to the normal triple ministry to teach, govern, and sanctify, that is, teach the gospel, run the diocese, and celebrate the sacraments, bishops have to do the following. A, deal with the fallout, financial, legal, and emotional, from the clergy sex abuse cases, usually cases they had nothing to do with. B, staff parishes in the face of rapidly declining vocations to the priesthood and religious orders. C, decide which parishes and schools to close or consolidate in the face of emotional pleas and angry protests, pickets and sit-ins from parishioners, neighbors, students, and alumni. D, help raise money for nearly every institution in their diocese, including schools, hospitals, retirement communities for priests and social service agencies, and E, answer complaints from furious Catholics that pour into their chanceries about everything you can imagine, including parish closings, as well as supposed liturgical abuses during Mass, stray comments that a priest made in a homily, an article they didn't like in the diocesan newspaper, even a Jesuit receiving an award from a group they don't like. <laughs> Compassion also leads to a certain equality of heart. That means coming to see that a few in positions and leadership in our church may be struggling themselves. They might be homosexual men who at a younger age were tortured by the same hateful attitudes that most LGBT people experienced growing up and entered a religious world that seemed to afford them some safety and privacy. This was far from the only reason that some of these men entered diocesan seminaries and religious houses of formation, but it may have been a factor in the appeal of that life, a certain privacy, a way to sincerely serve God without having to admit one's sexuality. A few may have remained with this worldview, even as over the last few decades the truth about being gay gradually became more easily understood and less terrifying to live with. This is what it is like to have been burdened by the effects of the hatred of gays and lesbians, particularly the hatred that existed decades ago, and not being able to admit a deep part of oneself. So LGBT Catholics are invited to feel for and pray for these, our brothers, even when their own backgrounds sometimes lead them to behave as if they were our enemies. The theologian James Allison, in a letter to me recently, called them our trapped brethren. The invitation is to see these bishops in their humanity, in their complexity, and amidst the great burdens of their ministry. There is compassion in trying to do this. Now I know, as all of you in this room do, that many LGBT people feel that the institutional church and a few priests and bishops have persecuted them. They see these men as their enemies, or at the very least, as people who misunderstand or mistrust them. And sadly, some bishops, priests, and deacons have said and done ignorant, hurtful, and hateful things. But I believe these actions represent a minority in the hierarchy, albeit one that recently seemed to hold some sway in the church, and that the tide is slowly changing and that Pope Francis's papacy and the actions of some church leaders today is helping to heal some of that hurt. What is the Christian response if you still feel that way towards select Catholic leaders? By way of a suggestion, let me tell you a story. When I was 27, I told my parents I was entering the Jesuit novitiate. I sprang the news on them with no warning, zero warning. I hadn't even told them I was considering it. Not surprisingly, my parents, who are good Catholics, were confused and upset. 
That is an understatement. (laughs) They saw it as reckless, foolish. And that confused and upset me. And I wondered, how could they not see what I was doing? How could they not understand me? In response, my Jesuit spiritual director said something very wise. You've had 27 years to get used to this, Jim. You just sprung it on them. Can you give them the gift of time? Challenging as it may be to hear, and without setting aside the suffering that many LGBT people have experienced in their church, real suffering, I wonder if the LGBT community could give the institutional church the gift of time. Time to get to know you. Because in a very real way, an open and public LGBT community is new. I was talking about this with my friends Ivan and uh, Marcos, right? The father and son who are here. This is new even in my lifetime. In a very real way, the world is just getting to know you. So is the church. I know it's a burden, but it is not surprising because it takes time to get to know people. So perhaps the LGBT community, in its compassion, can give the institutional church the gift of patience. The other Christian response, even if, after all this, you still perceive some few church leaders as your enemies, is to pray for them. And that's not me talking, it's Jesus. Finally, sensitivity. Let's return to that beautiful word. We can use it again in terms of not denigrating the bishops or the hierarchy. Again, that's not only simply human courtesy, it's Christian charity. But I'd like to use sensitivity in another way. Here, I would like to invite the LGBT community to more deeply consider who is speaking and how they are speaking. As Catholics, we believe in various levels of authority in our church. Not every church official speaks with the same level of authority. The simplest way of explaining this is what the Pope says in in an encyclical is not the same level of authority as what your local pastor says in a homily. It just is a different level of authority. There are different levels of authoritative teaching which begin with the Gospels, the church councils, and then papal pronouncements. Even different papal pronouncements have different levels of authority. Among the highest would be constitutions or encyclicals addressed to the whole church, then apostolic letters and motu proprios, then the Pope's daily homilies and speeches and so on. It's important to be sensitive to that. There are also documents from synods and individual Vatican congregations. Then on the local level, documents from bishops' conferences and local bishops. Each has a different level of authority. They all need to be prayerfully read and considered, but it's important to know that they do not all have equal authority. Of course, the hierarchy is not the only group that speaks with authority in the church. Authority resides in holiness as well. Holy men and women who are not members of the hierarchy, like St. Teresa of Calcutta, and holy sisters like Janine Gramic and holy lay people like Dorothy Day or Jean Vanier speak with authority. Also, be careful about taking what the mainstream media says, I hate that expression, by the way, because I work in the media, what the mainstream media says about church teaching at face value. A few weeks ago, I read this headline, quote, Keep homilies to eight minutes, comma, Vatican tells clergy, end quote. And I thought, the Vatican? Sure enough, when you read the article carefully, you discovered something else entirely. It was one individual bishop who happened to work in the Vatican offering his suggestions for homilies. So the headline was completely false. The Vatican wasn't doing any such thing but we tend to get most of our news about the church through the mainstream media, right? So again, to use that word, be sensitive. 
Moreover, there is an invitation to be sensitive to the fact that when someone in the Vatican speaks, whether the Pope or a Vatican congregation, they are speaking to the whole world, not just the West, and certainly not just to the United States. Something that seems tepid in the United States might be shocking in Latin America or Africa. To that end, I was disappointed in the reaction of some LGBT Catholics in this country to the Pope's beautiful apostolic exhortation on the family Amoris Laetitia, the joy of love. In that document, Pope Francis said, quote, we would like, before all else, to reaffirm that every person, regardless of sexual orientation, ought to be respected in his or her dignity and treated with consideration, while every sign of unjust discrimination is to be carefully avoided, particularly any form of aggression and violence, such families should be given respectful pastoral guidance so that those who manifest a homosexual orientation can receive the assistance they need to understand and fully carry out God's will in their lives. End quote. Before all else, LGBT people should be treated with dignity. That is an immense statement from our church. And by the way, nowhere in that endless document, by the way, Amoris Laetitia, are the words objective disorder or intrinsically disordered. Nonetheless, among some LGBT Catholics, those lines were dismissed with cries of, not enough. Well, perhaps in the West, those words seem insufficient. But the Pope is not writing simply for the West, much less simply for the United States. Imagine reading that in a country where violence against LGBT people is rampant and the church has remained silent. What is bland in the United States is incendiary in other parts of the world. What might be obvious to a bishop in our country is a clear, forceful, and even threatening challenge to a bishop somewhere else. What seems arid to LGBT people in one country may be in another country water in a barren desert. So we are called to be sensitive in many ways. Overall, my brothers and sisters, the invitation is for both the institutional church and the LGBT community to step onto a bridge of mutual respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Now, some of this may be hard to hear for the LGBT community. It's hard to step on that bridge. And some of this may be challenging for bishops to hear because neither lane on that bridge is smooth. And on this bridge, as in life, there are tolls. It costs when you live a life of respect, compassion, and sensitivity. It takes a toll. But to trust in that bridge is to trust that eventually people will be able to cross back and forth easily and that the hierarchy and the LGBT community will be able to encounter one another, to accompany one another, to love one another. It is to trust that God desires unity. We are all on that bridge together because, of course, that bridge is the church. And ultimately, on the other side of the bridge for each group, is welcome, community, and love. In conclusion, I would like to say something specifically to the LGBT brothers, my LGBT brothers and sisters. In difficult times, and I know you face them, you might ask, what keeps the bridge standing? What keeps it from collapsing onto the sharp rocks? What keeps me from plunging into the dangerous waters? The answer is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is supporting the church and is supporting you. For you are beloved children of God, who by virtue of your baptism have as much right to be in the church as the Pope, as your local bishop, and me. 
Of course, that bridge has some loose stones, some big bumps, and some deep potholes. Sometimes it seems like you can see right through the bridge because the people in our church are not perfect. We never have been. Just ask St. Peter. And we never will be. We are all imperfect people, struggling to do our best in the light of our individual vocations. We are all pilgrims along the way, loved sinners following the call we first heard at our baptisms and that we continue to hear every day of our lives. In short, my brothers and sisters, you are not alone. Millions of your Catholic brothers and sisters accompany you, as do your bishops, as we journey imperfectly together on this bridge, which is the church. More importantly, we are accompanied by God, the reconciler of all men and women of goodwill, as well as the architect, the builder, and the foundation of that bridge. Thank you very much. Father Jim, you've inspired us and you've challenged us, and I think you've planted a lot of seeds that will grow in, in the future years to come. I really see this as, a, as, in some ways, a new beginning for our movement, and, and I thank you for inaugurating it. Uh, we now have some time for questions for Father Martin. Um, this is one of my uh, least likely chores. I'm going to ask that when you ask your question, to please keep your question to under one minute. <laughs> We've heard the main speaker today. <laughs> so uh, in order to get enough, as many questions and comments in as possible, uh, I'm going to time you. <laughs> now, I think what I'll do is I'll have them speak and then I'll repeat it. It's okay. All righty. So... So, so Stand up, yeah. speak loudly, and, and I'll repeat Father it. Martin will repeat it. Because I can hear you fine. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think I find that easier than the microphone because people run around. So any questions about anything, and I reserve the right to pass on something. <laughs> questions, yes, in the green. How do we help bring family members and friends back to the church who are LGBT members? How do we show them love? How do we bring family members who are LGBT members back to the church? How do we show them love? Um, and what was the second part without? Uh, you know, in, in accordance with the church's teaching church. about their lifestyle. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I think that the best, the best way to bring people back to the church, look, Francis of Assisi, I, I love the preach the gospel, always use words when necessary. You know, I have a lot of people who say, you know, how do I bring my LGBT Catholic? It's usually son or daughter. Uh, back to the church. And I always say be a good Catholic, not in a scolding way, but, you know, if you live a joyful life that your, your children will eventually see that this is an important thing. I also think listen to them. You know, take seriously their, their struggles. Don't dismiss them. You know, oh, I feel the church doesn't listen to me. Oh, no, they don't. Yes, they do. Really listen. You know, what, what, what makes you feel like that? Also, try to find them a good home. I am a big proponent of parish shopping. I mean, I really am. I know that was verboten when I was growing up. Uh, but find a place that is welcoming. I know it's, it's easier in big cities. You know, for example, in New York, I can, and even in DC, I can rattle off and Baltimore, places that are LGBT friendly. That's very important. Uh, and, but, you know, listen to them. Try to encounter them and also be patient with them. It's, it's, it is difficult. But, you know, you could say the same thing for, for, for straight people. You know, how do I get my son or daughter back to the church? It's, it's very similar. But for LGBT people who I think have been made to feel so marginalized, the other thing is frankly point to Pope Francis. Highlight what, highlight five most famous words, who am I to judge? That changed everything. 
That was shocking. And you know what I loved about that was that, which I, I this is a little schadenfreude, but um, <laughs> when he said that, a, a number of people in the media and commentators said, well, he was only talking about gay priests. So on the next papal uh, trip, someone asked him, were you only talking about gay priests? No, I was talking about everybody, all gay men and women of goodwill. And I thought, good for you. That's what you get for asking that question. So yeah, so so point to the Pope and point to people who are who are open and who are welcoming. And then the other thing is point to Jesus Christ. And some of these stories I, I find very helpful. Zacchaeus, the centurion, the woman at the well. I mean, on and on and on. He's constantly reaching out to people who feel who specifically feel on the margins. The movement from Jesus is always from the outside in. So point to that, you know, and you know, just accompany them. So it's a tough question though. Other questions, comments? Yes. On the first topic, I have zero experience on that and zero, I'm, I'm being serious, zero expertise, so I don't know how I would answer that question. The second topic in terms of uh, teaching them uh, celibacy and chastity, uh, I think, you know, one of the things in terms of uh, chastity for me uh, is talking about what it's like to live chastely. So I think if they meet someone who's chaste, uh, you know, myself, uh, not just me, talk to them what it means to live a chaste life and what that means. So to sort of talk from your own experience, basically. I always think that the one-on-one -on -one encounter is the best way to explain these things rather than the kind of didactic, uh, you know, here, here's here's a list of what the church teaches, to talk about your own experience. So that, that's what I find helpful. So Pope Francis uh, said the word transgender for yes. the first time, and uh, it was after his encounter with a Spanish man and his wife, and I was just wondering, what advice do you have for uh, American Catholic transgender people encountering their bishops here? So uh, Pope Francis used the word transgender, which in and of itself was a step forward. Uh, and, you know, talked about his experience. And what ex what would I say to a transgender person in terms of their bishop? Uh, to, is that the question? How to encounter bishops. How to encounter bishops. You know, I think, you know, in as much as we are um, still, well, let me put it this way, in as much as the United States is still coming to understand uh, LGBT people, it's really struggling and is just beginning to understand the transgender person. I mean, really, this, I mean, the, the, the past few years, really, right? Uh, and so I think the most important thing is encounter. Um, you know, maybe I'm just maybe going up to the bishop and saying, Bishop, you know, I just want to introduce myself. I'm a transgender person. I'm a faithful member of the church. I'm here at the parish, and it's nice to meet you. And if you ever have any questions about those things. So I, I think, as Pope Francis says, encounter and accompaniment. And the pope was talking about his own encounter with someone very sensitively, you know. He, we were, I was talking to some Jesuit friends of mine. He himself is still struggling to understand this. Because I think for a lot of people, like... Um, gay and lesbian might have been um, 30, 40 years ago, it was hard to kind of comprehend. He himself is still trying to understand this. So I think the encounter, I know I keep coming back to that, is very important. Rather than seeing a category, you see a person. You know, you hear a story. Uh, you listen to their struggles. I think it's impossible to, to, to meet a transgender person and to not feel sympathy. You know, I don't know many, I've met a few, you know, even I, I don't know many transgender people. But to hear their story and, and to feel sympathetic, it's impossible not to feel that sense of compassion. And so that's something I think to, in a sense, to offer the bishops, you know, the, their experience. Yeah, it's, that's a hard question. That's, it's just very kind of cutting edge, I would say. So thank you for that. Uh, other questions, comments? Yes, in the yellow. Um, the phrase, uh religious freedom become popular for uh, justifying discrimination, and yet there are uh, a few bishops that uh, take issue with the phrase religious freedom being used as equivalent to discrimination. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. 
Yeah, it's a hard question. I mean, I, 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 I struggle to answer that question because, and I, I don't mean this as a, um, I'm sorry, I said, I, right, I'm not repeating any of these questions. So the bishops talk about religious freedom, um, and uh, they sometimes, you said they feel that they use it as a kind of uh, sort of cloak for, dis for discrimination, right? I, I struggle to answer that question because I'm not a political person, frankly. I, I don't, I sincerely don't know the ins and outs of some of these cases, you know, like the Hobby Lobby case and the Little Sisters of the Poor, which are very complex. And are they participating in, uh, you know, uh, birth control and abortion and in what way? And what does moral theology teach us about remote participation and near participation? So it's quite complex. I would say this, um, I think that um, when the bishops speak about religious persecution, uh, they should speak just as loudly about real religious persecution overseas. To me, that's true religious persecution. You know, people who are being killed and beheaded for being Christian or Catholic. And so my hope would be that when the bishops speak about these things, and they have a right to speak about these things in the political sphere, that they that they use that word guardedly. Does that make sense? Because I think it can be used in a way that I would say equates uh, one thing with another that shouldn't be equated. But that's it's a it's and I'm I'm just freely admit I'm not a political person, so I don't I don't follow those things as much. Yeah, it's a good question though. Yes, in the blue tie. Is there a place in the LGBT community for the condemnation of religious authorities who are struggling with their own sexuality and who take it out on others? In all sincerity, I would say Jesus judges. God judges, not us. So condemnation, no. I, I, that's, I really would say that. I mean, uh, these men, I would assume, are struggling with their sexuality. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't oppose them and can't critique them and can't respond to them you know, and can't challenge them. Uh, but for the, for one thing, you know, most of us have no idea which bishops are struggling with their sexuality. And, but condemnation, I would, I would avoid. I really, I mean, I, you know, judge not, I think. So, yes, in the stripes. Who or what is the LGBT community? How or what would I just, how would I describe it? Uh, to me, um, it's very broad. I mean, I know that those acronyms keep getting bigger. LGBTQIA. I, I, and I, I don't mean this in any denigrating way. I do have a hard time keeping up with the acronym. I, I really mean that. I know. What is the straight community? Well, you know, I would say it's, it's, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, questioning. People, I give people the right to define themselves, right? And to say who they are and to identify themselves. And so the LGBT community, I would think, are the people who want to belong to that community and who identify themselves as that community. Does that make sense? Oh, I see what you're saying. When I say the LGBT community, I mean everyone. I mean everyone. All LGBT people. I see what you're saying. Not just kind of... Uh, certain uh, organizations or causes. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean everybody. So there's the uh, there's an interesting dichotomy between how the church relates to the LGBT community, right? That's one, and LGBT Catholics. That's another. You know, I mean, they are relating in a sense to both. So, for example, when bishops or church leaders would condemn violence against LGBT people, I think they're relating to the LGBT community. Well, let me just finish for a second. Let me, let me just finish for a second. But when they are talking about sort of pastoral outreach, they're talking about LGBT Catholics. Now, say again, I'm sorry. That's that, which is part of... Right. But what, what's the question? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, as I see the LGBT community, it's very broad. That's, that's how I'm, that's how I'm kind of imagining it. Yeah. Questions, uh, oh my gosh, so many. Yes, in the yellow tie. Uh, 
Father, when you open up the uh, New Ways Ministry newsletter and you mentioned the welcoming parish list, there's probably a half a dozen of them in the Baltimore Archdiocese. I'm proud that our parish, St. Matthew, is listed in that, in that uh, directory. My question to you is, what advice do you give to pastors who would like to have an LGBT ministry at their parish? They know they've got LGBT in, in their pews, but they're afraid of any backlash from conservative parishioners, and they don't want to get a call Monday morning from the Archdiocese. Well, the, the, I'll answer in a funny way than in a serious way. Um, none of them have asked me yet. Um, um, I would say most Jesuit parish, well, all Jesuit parishes that I know, you know, are welcoming to LGBT people. So that's the first thing. So that's that's the group I deal with mostly. Um, yeah, what would I? That's a good question. What would I say to this? Is hypothetical. What would I say to someone like that? I would say these people are in your parish. You know, these are, these are Catholics. They are baptized Catholics. They are in your parish. Reach out to them. And if your bishop has a problem with that, talk to him about that and remind him that they are baptized Catholics too. I, I, I mean, I, I think to stand up for these people. You know, what would you say to someone if the bishop said you shouldn't have an outreach for, you know, young adults? You'd say, well, they're part of our parish. So I would say advocate for them. Yes, in the in the way in the back and the with the long hair. I don't mean to comment on your appearance, but that's yeah, yeah. What advice would I give to the child? You mean the parent. What advice would I give to the parent of a child uh, who is coming out? Um, well, it, it's you know, it, it, that's actually that's actually easier than you would think, because the first question I say to the person is, "Tell me how you feel about your child." Tell me how you feel about your child. Exactly, and they usually say, "I love my child," and and we start from there. You know, do you love your child? Uh, you know. Unconditionally, yes, you know. And what are you worried about? You know, usually the usually the parent is worried about the child's going to be persecuted or marginalized or lonely. That's another thing. They're going to be lonely, and so to kind of talk to them and, and inform them a little bit about you know what life is like now for LGBT kids. You know, but I start with the love. You know, I start with the love, and and really that that's the beginning and the end. And I also say, you know, if someone comes to me worried and upset, it means that they love their child so much. And I always say, trust yourself. You know, you love, you look how much you love your child. You're not going to do anything wrong. You know, it's the ones who, who, who don't ask the questions who I think, you know, it's troublesome for. That's a beautiful question. You know, it's, it's such a thing to be able to accept your child uh, as, a, as a gay person or as a lesbian or a transgender. I mean, it's such a gift. That, that parents, I think, in, in 20 or 30 years ago were not, I would say, equipped to give. Uh, things are so different now, and that's such a beautiful thing, you know? So that's a great question. Other questions? Yes, in the, with the sweater. I, I wanted to go first. Well, sure. And two words that we use in a press conference recently. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it's such a great solution or what, but he said, first of all, as my life as a priest and bishop, even as a pope, I have accompanied people with homosexual tendencies. I have also met homosexual persons, accompanied them, brought them closer to the Lord as an apostle, and I have never abandoned them. People must be accompanied as Jesus accompanies them. When a person who has this condition arrives before Jesus, surely Jesus did not tell them to go away because you are homosexual. If I just read that, he said, condition and tendencies. I'm not sure if the, what language you're using in the press conference, but why are they using the word? Well, two things to remember. One, it is, there are translations, right? So, condizioni might mean something totally different in Italian. Tendencia may be totally, totally different in Italian. Um, but the other thing is, you know, for me, I understand your question. The question was, you know, he's using words like condition, tendency, which can seem 
denigrating or clinical or, or, or odd or antiquated, I always say to people, and I'm not trying to uh, sort of uh, minimize your question or your concern, the real meaning of that sentence is what he said. I have accompanied gay people. That is the, while I was pope, that, that was the news there. I have accompanied gay people, not when I was a Jesuit provincial or rector of some seminary or archbishop of Buenos Aires. After I was pope, I have accompanied people. That's a beautiful sentiment. And honestly, I wouldn't get too hung up on condition or tendency. He's also, as I always like to remind people, he is your 81-year-old Argentine grandfather. You know? <laughs> and so he uses certain words that come out. I think the fact that he used the word gay was amazing. That's the first time. Or transgender, I couldn't believe that, you know? So so rather than looking at condition or tendency, I think look at what he's doing and what he has said that he's doing, which is accompanying people. Yeah. Uh, yes, in the peach color. Well, I would say there are certain things that we have to that we have to distinguish that are different. Chastity, first of all, is the vow that religious orders take. Okay, celibacy is the promise that priests make not to marry. Okay, homosexuality, right, is same-sex attraction, as we all know. Pedophilia is much different than homosexuality, celibacy, chastity. Um, married priesthood is also different. So I think that what's happened is all of those things have gotten lumped together. You know, i.e., celibacy causes pedophilia, that's, which is baloney. I'm celibate and chaste, and I don't do that, right? Uh, or that married people don't commit pedophilia, which is also false. So I think what's happened is all these things have gotten mixed up in the public mind when they need to be sort of pulled out and understood. They are all different things. So I'll just say very blunt, you know, I'll just say very strongly, the conflation of pedophilia with homosexuality is false. You know, that's simply false. And it is also false to say because someone is celibate they are more likely to be a pedophile or chaste, right? Because as we know, most sexual abuse happens in families. So, which is separate from the question of a married priesthood. You know, so you can't say if priests were married, they wouldn't be committing pedophilia because then you look at families, you know, where, 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 where fathers, you know, do that to their children. So we need to, we need to be very careful about separating all of those different things and looking at them carefully and kind of defining them and not lumping them all together because what happens is that the gay priest, the celibate gay priest, is tarred with the brush of pedophilia because people don't understand homosexuality, they conflate it with pedophilia, and they don't understand chastity and celibacy. And so what has happened is that the gay priest has become a kind of... kind of... Uh, I can't think of an expression, a kind of the person to blame for all of this. Uh, pardon me? Scapegoat. Scapegoat, thank you. So it's very careful to distinguish between those things. Uh, yes? So the question is, um, you know, Catholics who are gay get it from, you know, get, get opposition from both sides. Catholics say, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how can you be gay and be in the church? And gay people say, how can you be gay and be a Catholic? 
Um, and you're right that, that that is actually, that's a problem for even older Catholics, uh, basically, you know, uh, young adults, adults, and even elderly uh, gay Catholics. Um, and it's difficult because you feel like you're not, in a sense, pleasing anybody, right? And you feel like, in a sense, you can feel like you're always wrong. There, are, there, are, there aren't people who are saying you're, you know, you're, you're doing a good job or you're on the right path. Um, I think once again, it's a question of explaining. And so, when people say, "How can you be gay and Catholic?" you tell them, "This is my experience. You know, I was born this way. I'm baptized Catholic." Uh, I love my church. Here's why I love my church. I don't agree with everything that is going on in my church. I sometimes say to people, are you an American? And they said, do you agree with everything that's going on in the United States? No. Do you love your country? Yes. It's a good analogy for people. How can you stay in the United States if you don't agree with it? Well, I'm, that's, that's who I am. I'm an American. I'm born that way. Well, but, etc. right? So to, to kind of use analogies. But you know, um, to really just speak from your heart. I mean, I think that the most authentic and the most authentic evangelization is your own experience. This is what I've experienced. I, you know, I go to this great church and they have a great LGBT group and I love it. And I met this sister who was really kind to me. And have you ever heard of New Ways Ministry? And boy, they're Catholic too. And I love that. And, and you can help open people's minds like that. It, it is it is difficult. It is difficult, and it takes a lot of patience. And I think of Jesus. I mean, he wasn't pleasing the religious authorities of his time, and the disciples wanted him to really, like, you know, stir things up. So it's to try to maintain that center, but to always remember that you're baptized and that God called you into the church for a particular reason. You know, and it may be to help change and influence the church. That's the other thing. To see yourself as a leaven, to see yourself as, as part of the change that you want to, to help, um, happen in the church. That it's, that's a, it's a heavy responsibility, especially for someone who's young, but it's what God calls you to, you know, and to hope. And remember that God's on your side because God loves you. I mean, that's the other thing, that to hope. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Hi, I'm Joe I'm the pastor of the church here in Baltimore. We have a gay lesbian happening. We had it for about five years. And on Friday... Thank you. On Friday, two young men... I'm looking for some advice, pastor advice. Uh-oh. So the, the, the pastor asked the Jesuit who doesn't work in a parish for advice. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Father. I see my job, I see my job, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, so two young men called me on Friday, and in all innocence, uh, they are a couple. Uh, they said, Father Joe, we're getting married next June. What time do the gay and lesbian pre payment pass the beat? <laughs> and it wasn't, they weren't trying to be angry or sarcastic. They really thought that a church like that and had an outreach would have a gay and lesbian pre payment pass for couples that are going to be married. So I'm married a gay couple, but no, I'm not allowed to do that. But would you like to collaborate in developing a pre K course for gay and lesbian? Just to tell I'll put my name to it. I'm like <laughs> but we're going to think about something like that, putting something together for a young gay couple. I'm not asking you to do it, but I'm saying, what do you think? Just your advice uh, on that. <laughs> what diocese are you in? What does your bishop say? I talk to him a lot about all this. I haven't gotten to that Well, I would say, and I'm, I'm not being, I'm not, I'm not trying to be flip with these things, but, um, you know, one works within the confines of, you know, what the, what the ordinary will allow you to do, basically. So, you're asking me what I would do, I mean, I'd have to ask my provincial for something like that, because that's really sort of pushing the boundaries. Um, well, let me ask you, but you're the pastor. What, what, what did you say to him? I said, well, um, I worked with one other couple several years ago, and I gave them my heterosexual pre-marriage spiel, and they said, that makes sense to us, it's a relationship. So there wasn't anything different that, I, that they said, that I was telling them that they didn't know it. 
And so that was one part. Then the other thing I said was, we have some older gay couples in the parish. I'd like to refer you to them. They can give you the benefit of their experience. And they said, oh, that would be great. We'd love to do that. So I'm going to meet with them on Monday and talk a little bit about what I normally talk to couples who get married about. And then at some point, turn it over to a fully gay couple and marry a lesbian couple and help them think through a relationship. That would be that. Uh, Janine wants to add something. Janine is my mother. You look so young. <laughs> but Joe, um, I know that there are some million centers of libraries, but um, a priest uh, was asked the same thing and um, said, well, he would like to have a marriage preparation courses for couples. Didn't say same-sex couples, opposite-sex couples. This is a course on marriage preparation. One more. Uh, maybe one more question. An easy one, please. <laughs> and all the hands go down. Actually, we haven't. Yes, you've been very patient in the blue. In the blue. Yes. Thank you. I would like to add uh, to your explanation to the gentleman talk about the focus of being a tradition. Sometimes his comments are translated in such a way that the, the subtleties of the different languages is not taken into consideration. In Italian, condition is conditionale, condition. And conditione comes from the state that you are in. That's your condition. The same, the same way that it's very difficult in English to translate the verbs spit, said, and stuff. Spanish because there are two universalities on the difference of the word. In the same way that the word condizione means the way you are in. So he wasn't referring to it as a clinical word. I have to tell you that I have known of uh, Francis since I was 17 years old. And I know that... You know, let me hear. You get the <laughs> 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 I have known uh, Pope Francis since he was my teacher, uh, my professor in high school when I was 17 years old. And I knew, and I know that he knew that, that I was there. And we have been friends ever since. Uh, I visited him in Rome, and then we visited when he came to Washington. And uh, he met, who was at that time, my, my boyfriend both times, and he's always asking about him. And um, when the, the, the gay marriage law was being discussed in the Senate in Argentina, I read in the internet that uh, then Cardinal Bergoglio was very much against it and that he has said really painful and hateful things about, about uh, uh, the approval of the law. I was very surprised and I was very surprised more, more than anything else because knowing him and knowing how how much love there is in his heart, it was difficult for me to to understand that he will do such a hateful thing. Words like this is the word, the word of God. Uh, this is a temptation, temptation from the from the devil, etc. So I wrote him a quite extensive letter. I sent him an email telling him how much I admire him, how much 
how important he was on in my life and how much he did for me, how he had brought forward through his education uh, the most uh, open and progressive thoughts in my life. And then I went on saying, mm, I, I, I never, I, I, I never be able to thank you for all this. So you might think that it's a very strange way to thank you if I tell you that I'm very disappointed by the way you treated the, the, the gay ball. And I went on with the, with the, with the explanation, I, the letter is too, too long, and it's very personal, so I will not, I will not go into it. He replied two days later, and the first thing he said was, first of all, I want to ask you to forgive me because I realized that, I have, that, that you are hurt. Believe me, I never said any of those things. The press picked up from different from two letters that I sent to the nuns, asking them not to admit any kind of opinion on this. And they were distorted and they were put as my words. But the most beautiful thing, and to me the most amazing thing, and we are talking about 2008, he ends up his letter, besides asking me to pray for him, which is he always does, saying, Yeah, you believe me, in my parochia, uh, in my um, pastoral work, there is no place for homophobia. <laughs> and that is the first time. <laughs> What an amazing person he was. He, not only he said, who am I to judge, there is something very important that he said later. And he said, who are we to judge? With that we, wasn't just a personal discourse. Uh, 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 we was the whole church and the whole human family. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful way to end uh, our session. Thank you, Father Martin, for answering some some challenging and and interesting questions. And um, I was uh, now at the point as as any good church event announcements. Um, and one of them has already happened. I was going to say that we have a special guest with us today. Um, you remember last year when Pope Francis was visiting and there was the flare up with Kim Davis. And, um, and then a few days later, we learned that the Pope had not met with her, but had only met with one, with one person in the United States for a personal visit. And that was his former student. Imagine my surprise this week, last week, when I got a call from Yayo Grassi, the former student, who said he wanted to be here today. So I'm glad that he not only was here, but got a chance to share some of his story with us. Thank you. Yayo. I also want to thank everyone who made this event possible, in particular the, those who gave financial support and who are listed in our program booklet. We thank you for your generosity. I want to thank our volunteers who helped staff the registration table. Dave Lambden, Dave Vesper, Brian McLaughlin, Pierre Bergeron, Matt Turner, Malachi Kilbride, and Jim Fahey. Thank you very much. I want to recognize 
The people you saw, Janine and I, up here on the stage, but the staff who are behind the scenes who make so much of New Ways Ministry work, and they are Matt Myers, Bob Shine, and Glenn Bradley. We also have two other special guests with us today, past Bridge Building Award recipients who have come all the way from Rochester, New York, driving down today, the founders of Fortunate Families, Mary Ellen and Casey Volpata. <laughs> On a final note, I'd like you to please mark your calendars for April 28th to 30th, 2017, Chicago, when we will be having New Ways Ministries 8th National Symposium on the back, inside back cover of your program. The 8th National Symposium is entitled, Justice and Mercy Shall Kiss LGBT Catholics in the Age of Pope Francis. So in many ways, it will be a continuation of a lot of the discussion we've heard today. It promises to be an exciting weekend, and if you've ever been to a symposium, you know that they can be life-transforming experiences. Um, finally, I want to let you know that after um, uh, we have our closing benediction, you're invited to reception in the back area here where uh, Father Martin will graciously sign his books, autograph his books, and they will be, he will be at that back table in the corner, and the books, some books will also be available for purchase if you didn't get to uh, buy some beforehand. Finally, let me say, especially to those on um, watching us on live stream, but to all of you as well, this will be archived on New Ways Ministries' YouTube channel. So if there's anything you want to review, uh, you could look for it there. Tell them the Wall Street on America, the text oh, yes. on America uh -huh. Magazine's website. The text, uh, America Magazine is putting the text of, the, of Father Martin's talk on their website uh, right now. <laughs> so... So now, I, uh, for the closing benediction, I'd like to introduce a longtime and faithful supporter of New Ways Ministry, a woman who has been a tireless advocate and a prophet in the church in support of her two gay sons and for all LGBT Catholics. She's a founding member of the Catholic Parents Network in Philadelphia, and we're proud that she's with, here with us today, Suzanne Cassidy. God of life and God of love, you made us as wonderful creations with the ability to live and love fully. You gave us voices to speak truth courageously. You gave us hearts to reach out to one another with compassion. And you gave us consciences to discern justice in all our encounters. We ask your blessings today on Father Martin, who has used his voice his heart and his conscience to call our church and its leaders to greater outreach and welcome to the LGBT people. We thank you for the wonderful gift that he is to our church and to the LGBT community. We ask your blessings too on all of us that we may be inspired by Father Martin to live more prophetically as we go about building your vision of a world of justice, equality, and right relationships. 
We ask you to bless all those who feel alienated from you, O oh God. And we ask you to give us the strength to build bridges to all those who need a connection. We ask all these blessings in the name of the greatest bridge builder of all, who taught us about your love in most powerful ways, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I will ask you as church to please say, Amen. Thank you. Thank you and enjoy one another's company.